All right, this is a conversation I've been looking forward to for quite a while now. Lindsay Alexander specializes in Russian disinformation, which is a topic that I've been fascinated with really since the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine kicked off a little more than a year ago. It's just been so interesting to see how closely connected the disinformation piece is to the way that Russia wages war. And whether you like it or not, because of social media, it's something that's reaching people all around the world every single day. So we talk about the history of Russian disinformation, how to counter that threat, and a little teaser, it's not through censorship, and the challenges in fighting the information fight in this current conflict. You can find Lindsay all across social media at the links below in the video description. Hope you enjoy. All right, Lindsay Alexander, thanks so much for taking the time to chat a little bit today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. So we're going to get into a realm of, I'm tying it to the war in Ukraine, and I'll kind of tell you how I, I got to that point. But would you mind giving just a little bit of your background, where you're coming from, what you've worked on, um, largely tied to misinformation and disinformation, which is, I think, what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about? Sure. Um, so... Right now, I've been in the private sector for a few years. I'm working with companies on um, a wide range of things from open source intelligence to combating um, and mitigating disinformation and misinformation and other harmful narratives. Uh, prior to that, I spent well over a decade at the CIA in the director of operations as a targeting officer. I specialize in um, Russia and the near abroad, so like Central Asia, Eastern Europe, uh, Ukraine, th those areas, essentially, and um, focus more on like counterintelligence and um, combating deception operations, um, specifically like disinformation falls under that. And um, throughout my time in the government, I've developed an expertise in this area and find it incredibly fascinating. And now that it's, um, you know, the hot topic of the day, it's great that people want to talk about it. Something that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people would look at me with like a sideways glance, like what's disinformation? Um, that's not important. And now everyone knows what that term is for the most part. So it is very interesting or they're using it. Um, so yeah, so I did that. I did spend a few years at the FBI as well in yeah. earlier on in my career, um, right before the agency. But yeah, happy to answer any questions. Awesome. So I... I'm in that camp of people that had heard the term, mostly I th maybe 2016 election, 2020, like it was it was used a lot um, in the domestic conversation around those times. But as we were talking beforehand, my background is kind of in terrorism studies. And when we think of, or when I think of terrorism, the term is propaganda. Um, mm -hmm. So for terrorism, for Islamic State, for Al Qaeda, it's, it's propaganda. When I think about near peer threats, I think of the term that comes to mind for me is Chinese censorship. But it's Russian disinformation and misinformation. What? Why? Like, why has that term been so heavily associated with Russia more than some of these other countries or groups? Yeah, um, that's actually a really good question. Yeah. All right. um, <laughs> no, it's a good question because um, not many people are talking about that, and it, it I find it very interesting. So, um, because there is. Um, disinformation is different than like propaganda and different than hoaxes and other things that it's being um, applied to in the current day and age, unfortunately. Um, but we do see it heavily uh, tied to Russia because um, Russia essentially coined the term, at least that we know, what we know now is disinformation. Um, they really coined that in the late 1800s and um prior to that they they've been working on this um doing disinformation under so many different names for um far longer than our country has been a country and this is kind of in other countries have done this as well russia is not the only country to have done this we just um borrowed one of their terms that they use for this type of practice essentially um and they are known as uh, being, I hate to give them credit in this area, but they are known as being um, very prolific in their disinformation and um, very active in um, conducting those types of campaigns more so than other countries. And they have the playbook, like the Chinese are currently using their playbook as well. 
um, the Russian playbook for disinformation. And it everyone recognizes Russia as being kind of superior when it comes to disinformation, unfortunately. Not saying other countries aren't getting there or will be there, but um, Russia is unfortunately good at it. I remember hearing something at one point that part of the reason that Russia's more advanced maybe in the, in this capacity than some other nations is that, and I don't know if this is true, so correct me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. but it was tied to the Cold War and how coming out of the Cold War, the United States was viewed as as the winner of that whole you know decades long conflict. So we didn't have to look at changing things very much. We had a success track essentially, but Russia had to do this kind of internal look of what can we be doing differently. This arms race didn't work, and they started to dive in deeper to some of the information operations. Is there any truth to that, or is it just a good story that kind of may fit? I mean, I you could make the argument there is some truth to that. I know. Um, like during the Bolshevik revolution um, in the early 1900s, they really, um, and as like the Czechists, I won't go into Russian history, but as those parts of the, you know, the Russian government were forming, they were really, they were arguably just as active in disinformation and other types of deception okay. operations. Um, and they were heavily active as were like the United States and other countries throughout the Cold War um, as well. However, yeah, like the United States did spend most of its time trying to um, combat it. And we didn't really want to admit a lot of that was going on either. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, you could make the argument that um, because you know, there was a perception that the United States won it, um, won the Cold War, that Russia decided to fall back on what it does best. And that is deception operations. And they also um, have a different idea of morality when it comes to those types of campaigns and different than what Western countries like uh, Britain, the United States would do or see as effective in those campaigns. And so, um, that would be something that they would go towards, um, you know, using and stressing because it's been very effective for them, incredibly effective. We're still, and they know it, we're still um, digging out from the uh, d- the disinformation campaign surrounding AIDS in the 1980s. And there's other older disinformation campaigns that the Russians have used that we still aren't fully have a consensus on either and it's been decades so they it's effective for them so why not use it i hope that answers your question sorry that no, it <laughs> does wrong. it's it, it also so coming from the military background it, it's like an area that as an artilleryman like i wasn't spinning we didn't learn a lot about the information war was much more focused on do the right thing um ab- abide by the laws of war so you don't end up being the subject of an information war campaign by the adversary, there really wasn't much within the military. And I, I'm sure this has changed and not to speak for the military now, but in my training, we didn't spend very much time going over like how to counter Russian disinformation, but it's, it's everywhere. Now when you, when you jump online, it's flooding Twitter comment sections and YouTube videos. Um, how, how much of that, or is, is that kind of centralized coming out of an idea that's pushed down or are these just organic type things popping up left and right? Any idea on that? Yeah, um, that's something I'm currently actually doing a lot of research on um, because it is interesting to see like, and sorry if I talk way too much about history, but um, when you look at like the historical trend of disinformation, um russia has been known to target more internally and then externally it will do the the disinformation pertaining to like the military um and that's why most most of the public hasn't really cared or heard much about it because it hasn't necessarily impacted um the general public as much as it has recently are, are, when However, you say public you mean external to russian like american public yes american public okay. sorry yeah um or like western public in general um and so with like the advent of social media and 
you know, how fast information moves around the world. And you put that together with disinformation and other types of deception information um, campaigns, uh, the Russians figured out that it can be effective and more impactful um, because a lot of their campaigns in the past would take uh, years to put together. And now you can do them in a matter of seconds. And I think what we saw um, globally with a lot of the like using COVID as an example, even though there were disinformation campaigns prior to that, um, a lot of that started off more centralized because that's just historically how they've been. Um, however, I think there's other elements that are coming into play with these disinformation campaigns where um, people are finding out they can make money off of them. And so that is a whole other area where people are grabbing onto the disinformation campaigns, making them their own and profiting. And so now it's just kind of a free for all of disinformation. And it's getting harder for those like in my position and other positions that are trying to like identify the source of that. Mm -hmm. um, because now it's so many different areas and a lot of people are seeing the profitability unfortunately in that and so to answer your question um it's not necessarily just a centralized russia area anymore it is more governments are getting involved more private entities are seeing a benefit unfortunately and so there's a lot of players emerging and we'll see that um we'll probably see a mess of it in the next you know five ten years than what we've seen before on the, the profitability piece, I think is interesting because I've seen, I, I tend to see some videos and some social media and articles that are, that are a little, um, they're clearly not accurate. I'll use that term, but they don't tend to make major, they might be mentioned in a news story, but they tend to originate in kind of some fringe sources. But then there's the question of, do you, you people start making videos and, and podcasts and, and posts to counter that? And at some point, it almost seems like there's more countering that claim than the original claim going around. And I can't tell if that's a good thing or not, because it kind of keeps it alive. Um, yeah. How do you decide that one? Or how do you tackle that? That's why disinformation is just so effective, because like <sighs> the disinformation can be in the countering of that, whatever that claim is. And it might not be in the claim itself. Um, the rush, like going back on the Russians, they're known to do both, like not just put out one narrative, but have it be the narrative and then the for and the against all being part of that disinformation. So none of it's real, but it looks real, essentially. Um, and people are fighting about it on all sides. And Infusion it's just, anything. yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like, um, sorry, what would, am I answering your question? <laughs> yeah, it was just, you know, I've seen, there's been some, some of the most fun content I've watched in the last few months is when people pick out one of these claims and just kind of piece by piece say, this is why it's incorrect. I don't know if, if we're using the term misinformation or disinformation, but anyways, proving a claim false. And it's very interesting. Um, but I wonder about that if it's, because then people are going to see that and be like, well, now I need to look up the claim. What was the original claim? And it almost gives it an extra breath of air, even though that breath is supposed to be, you know, deflating that balloon. Yeah, no, exactly. And um, I have seen, especially with like the war in Ukraine, a lot more coverage is being done on like the disinformation narratives and which I'm conflicted on because like to one extent, it's really important to show people what that looks like and, um, but then and you're also doing exactly what the disinformation is intended to do. And that is spread and where, wherever the chips fall, it falls. And so um, you see a lot more spreading of that disinformation and with the term disinformation, you know, also being misused a lot, <laughs> um, people use it now to their advantage. Everything's yeah. disinformation. And it's like, when I was in the government, it was a lot, you had to reach a lot of benchmarks because it was a big deal saying something was disinformation. And so it's just a different optic now and people are not trusting anything anymore. And so, um, yeah, it, it just makes it harder for 
it makes it easier for the disinformation to succeed and the misinformation um, and less so the truth because that's buried in there at this point. How do you draw that line between um, somebody said something that's incorrect? Like I get things wrong all the time, every day. Um, how do you draw the line between <laughs> that and disinformation or misinformation? Because I, I, I agree that term gets thrown out like it's crazy. Um, yeah. But but where and, is that? How do you figure that out? And like people make mistakes. And so yeah, you got to have that like grace because people aren't intentionally trying to manipulate or deceive for the most part. Well, some people are, but not everybody. Um, and just because they are doesn't mean it's disinformation either. Like, for misinformation, that is simply like incorrect information. Sometimes it can be used to manipulate, um, but that doesn't, but most often it's just like inaccurate information and that gets spread. That's more out there than actual disinformation. Like disinformation is a mix of true and false information, um, like or narratives essentially that was purposely created like the historical definition is by a foreign is created by a foreign entity but that's changing sure. um and with the intent to manipulate and mislead a particular audience to commit a certain action like there's a lot of factors in there okay. and so when i try to identify disinformation you need to identify not what the assumed source is um, or the foreign operator or the domestic operator or creator of that. Um, but who actually is that? And that's very difficult to like identify and then also identify the intent um, and why they're trying to manipulate and what that audience is and what the action is. Like all those different pieces really need to be looked at and identified to really determine if it's disinformation or if it's misinformation that got spread in like with no clear intent um because that happens so many people try to use misinformation um to get their views of, across not really recognizing <laughs> misinformation so um there's just a lot of different factors there um and so it makes it harder to suss out the disinformation and therefore more effective for that has the um so since the war in Ukraine kicked off, I, I've been able for the first time really to see some of the misinformation, disinformation. Um, previously, we would have just been reading about it in a historical context. Has that, the fact that it's more front and center, has that made your job easier because it's there um, or harder because it's, it's there times 10 in some places? I mean, both. Because like, it's interesting to see like how the Russians are very coordinated in their um like their entire campaign for not just disinformation but other types of deception that they're using in the ukraine um conflict uh like you're seeing a lot of um their i guess their narratives will come out of foreign government i'm sorry not foreign government um like russian government officials abroad and then you see it trickle down from the Kremlin. Like there's a different way that we're seeing their information come out, but it's all very coherent um, and very um, organized. And I would say it's actually very similar to um, how we're seeing like the, the Republican party essentially in the United States, not saying they're doing anything related or there's any um, links there, but their GOP is very organized in their messaging. And it's very similar to how the Russians are very organized in their messaging. Um, and some things that's sometimes that's good, sometimes not so much. Um, but with the conflict in Ukraine, that organization, they've always had that there. Um, but it is getting, the difficult part is getting people um, to really recognize like the harmfulness in the narratives. And because the Russians are doing a, a sort of good job at um, creating more division when they need to and creating conflict um, and doubt in mm -hmm. the information. We're seeing that with the Nord Stream pipeline explosion. We've seen like 
a handful of narratives come out regarding who did that. And, you know, somebody's doing something there. Um, and just other incidents surrounding, you know, that conflict as well. It's just creating more doubt and people aren't, aren't sure what to believe. And that's exactly like what disinformation is supposed to do. And so just trying to figure that out has made it a little bit more challenging and convince people like there's disinformation here. So um, like take a step back, don't react. Uh, that's that's probably the more challenging part. Sorry there's for been, the ramble. No, it's good. It's all good <laughs> information. There, there's been one recently that's been interesting about a, a Russian airstrike in Western Ukraine. You come across that? All right. Um, yeah. the, the gist is that, a, and there's variations of it for anybody who hasn't come across it, but the idea is that a Russian missile strike in Western Ukraine killed, and the number will vary, around 300 NATO generals in a bunker like 150 meters below the surface. And I'll watch that go back and forth in comment sections. And it's it's really, it's an interesting claim because when people say prove it wrong, it's like, I don't know how to, it's, you have to prove a negative. And I can't, mm -hmm. what you like, do you need current satellite imagery of every structure in West? Like you can't easily prove that wrong with in one, you know, cause then the immediate is nobody's going to report on it. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's like, ah, <laughs> it's, it's, in a sense, it's impressive. Some of the storylines and the ways these are put together. So they're hard to disprove, even when they're, you know, for the, for most of them, very clearly inaccurate. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it's interesting, like, there's so many, I don't know what else to call them, but like talking heads now with like mm -hmm. social media, that it just makes it easier um, and harder for for disinformation in general, especially like when you have a conflict, like what's going on in Ukraine, because everyone's talking about it. And so it's hard to trace the narrative and track it and to yeah. figure out what's what. like every there's people with a, a wide range of experience. And so when people talking about military things that aren't military and um, like Intel things that were in Intel and all these different things. So they're trying to be, cause they found Google maps or something like that. Yeah. And so just trying to like, yeah, it's crazy. It makes it harder if you're trying to suss it out. Um, but if I were like, a, like on the other side of it, like the one that created that narrative, um, like, man, you, you don't have to do anything. It's out there. And like, you just let, you know, everything go and it could be successful. So it, it makes your job easier if you're on the creator side of that. So, so what do we do? Because I agree what putting out, you can see you, you, you and I can sit here all day and come out with semi false narratives about whatever we want, that there's a little bit of truth. And then it just, instead mm -hmm. of following the straight path, it veers off a little bit at the end. And we could come up with hundreds of those in the next hour and just you know, shovel them out left and right. But the combating that takes so much more time and effort. How on earth is this? How do we handle this? It, it feels like an insurmountable problem. Yes, because it's in, we're getting like a deluge of information. And so it's overwhelming. And I have personally gone through like every different option for like combating this um, that I can think of at least. And the ones that seem more sensible to me um, have, are the ones where you focus on not necessarily discussing the what could be the disinformation, but educating like the general public on how to suss that out better, um, if that makes sense. Because when you yeah. when you look at countries um, in like Europe, like Sweden, Switzerland, Denmark, Finland, those countries that get hit in eastern europe with um like they have a strong history of russian disinformation and getting hit with it constantly the, it's very ineffective there like that type of disinformation and russia now knows that um i think i think it's sweden it's here sweden or switzerland that recently had a poll or say that came out that said like it's almost incredibly ineffective there just because the education of the population like yeah. most people are educated and they they teach critical thinking at the youngest levels and they just continue to teach 
how to question narratives and how to like look at them from all different sides and, and how to gather sources and determine their reliability and the trust in institutions and all those things, thereby making um, disinformation ineffective. And when you look at what narratives fall, like what narratives do well or what narratives fail, um, you tend to see the ones that stick more in audiences that aren't all in the same education level, essentially, when it comes to um, like critical thinking and those types of things. And so the more you educate a population in that area and media literacy and everything that falls under that umbrella, the less effective disinformation will be. And so to get back to your question, I think it's like whack-a-mole, similar to terrorism, mm -hmm. you, you get Paris down, they, another one pops back up. Um, with disinformation, you can spend your whole life, your whole career going after each separate narrative and never catch up. And sure. like, I'm at the point where if you just focus on building those programs and educating the people and give the people back that, that, that power, that's going to be more effective. Um, but unfortunately, there are others, the other side of that coin, um, the other way you could, and countries have taken this um, route to disrupt disinformation is the censorship. And I'm not for that, but you can then censor information and um, filter, you know, the disinformation out, but that's not healthy. Well, to your point gonna, earlier, we're, we're confusing yeah. misinformation and disinformation with I got a number wrong on a tank specification. You don't want that censored, right? Um, right. <laughs> are we the easy targets now? Are we compared to some of these Eastern European countries? Are we easier targets for Russia in those campaigns? I think so, because like we were the youngest, like when it comes to Western countries, um, like we are one of the youngest countries having to deal with disinformation. Like disinformation has been known to everyone in Eastern Europe for decades, centuries. Um, and they're probably laughing at us, looking at us like what in the world? Um, because it is new to us. We're just now in you know, Sorry, 2020. Yeah, we're trying. yeah. <laughs> like just figuring it out kind of thing. And it's the new sexy term that everyone wants to talk about. And so, um, I think we have a lot of growing pains when it comes to that. Um, and I don't think it's going to be completely insurmountable for us um, because I think even though we are young when it comes to that type of exposure, um, I have a lot of faith in like the generations coming behind me. I'm like an elder millennial. So like the younger kids out there um, are doing so like they're really doing well when it comes to like critical thinking and questioning things and I think that's going to serve them well as they they grow up and get in government positions and all of that and that will help um, bridge that gap we've started moving along a positive route here after like a lot of negative in this conversation okay. <laughs> so let, let, let's wrap it up on a positive note here can you talk a little bit more about that media literacy and that training like what that I, I understand at a high level but what does that actually look like in practice yeah. Um, so I think it it has to draw on a a wide range of um, areas, for lack of a better term. Um, I know historically, media literacy courses and critical thinking courses have been like created by governments. Um, I think in our case, it would do us better to have you know, different representation from various sectors of society, um, like the medical sector, the economic, political, all those areas to help actually build and craft um, some sort of education that will um, teach everyone at each different age um, how to question things, you know, not in like a conspiratorial route, but how to take things apart and discern what information you can trust, what information you can't trust. Um, simple things like what a fact is, what an opinion is, like why are they different? Um, what is loaded language? Like why, why, why does it matter if you're getting exposed to that? And like 
um, how manipulation works when it comes to information, I think is really key and a, a key element to have in those types of um, training courses and really delve into, you know, giving each person that like personal responsibility to figure that out. Um, Cause people don't like to be told what to do. Um, and they, they don't want to feel like they're being controlled and they shouldn't be that way either. And so giving that power back to the people, like this is how you decide what this, the information is like, go make the decision for yourself. Um, I think is a fair way. There's going to be bumps in the road, lots of bumps, um, especially early on. But I think that might be the most successful long-term way that we have without getting into like censorship. It would be just the other alternative and that's just never good. Um, or a control of information or a government control of information. And that's not good either. Sure. And so, um, yeah, so I hope that answered your question, but yeah, yeah. I think that's, I, I'm cautiously optimistic too. Now that I think about it, just there's so many additional sources and I know this can be a challenge in the disinformation space, but there's so many additional sources coming online every day, whether it's a YouTube mm -hmm. channel or another, you know, rumble, whatever it might be, podcasts, um, newsletters, mm -hmm. Substack. All, there's so many different sources that you can get your information from. If we decide, if you, you or I decided, I don't want to listen to any more American commentators, I'm only going to listen to Spanish ones or British ones. Like you can do that today. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to think the optimistic side of me says that when you have access to all of that, you'll find somebody that you trust and that you believe in and that person will have earned your trust um, the right way. So yes. yeah, maybe that's a good thing. I mean, it is a good thing and hopefully it's, it, it, it ends up being a net positive in the situation. Right. And I, I will say like to add on to like that, whoever people find that earns their trust, like always seek out the opposite and like other people don't just get information from just like that one source even if it's one you trust even if it's you or me <laughs> um go somewhere else too and question things don't be afraid to just ask questions because people should have those answers and not get hostile to you for you know asking a question either so i think the natural question then is the follow-on conversation from this needs to be with a russian what GRU disinformation special? Not <laughs> most point of view. Most point. I don't know if I want to. Yeah, it'd be an interesting conversation for what it's worth. Maybe one that defects. That, um, we'll see. That, but, that would. Yeah. Lindsay, thank you so much for taking the time. If people want to look you up, reach out, contact you. What's the best way to find you? Yeah, I am disinfo gal on. Most social media channels. Um, I'm starting YouTube soon, but I am on there. Um, TikTok, Twitter, although that's dying. Um, Instagram. Um, <laughs> you, you can reach out on any of those platforms. Awesome. We'll put the links to all of those in the description below. But Lindsay, thanks again. And uh, yeah, hope to stay in touch. Yeah, thank you.